Let us pray. God, open our ears to hear your word. Open our hearts to receive your word. Open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world around us. And open our lives to the infinite possibilities born of your love. Amen. It's not fair. How many times have we heard those words in our households? It's not fair. He got something I didn't get. She got something I really wanted. How many times have we heard those words? Because it's this, there's something in our human nature that when we look around and we see someone else who has something that we think we might want, and we learn this as children, don't we? We learn this at a very early age. I want that. Give me that. And somehow, I'm not sure that we ever shake that notion. And particularly among siblings. From the earliest siblings recorded in scripture, we see that there are some tensions, don't we? When Cain realizes that the sacrifice that Abel makes to God seems to be accepted more than his own sacrifice, yeah, those first siblings, Cain decides to take Abel's life. The very first siblings recorded in scripture. And this business about inheritance, well, that's its own little sticky wicket because we can stay in the book of Genesis. We don't even have to go very far in the scriptures. We can stay in the book of Genesis and we can find that whole ugly little story between Jacob and Esau. Remember those guys? So Jacob's really the younger of the two twins, but birth order matters in the ancient world. And so I need to be the older twin so badly that I'll pretty much do anything. I'll lie to dad, I'll lie to anybody, I will cheat, I will steal, I will do whatever I have to do to get the birthright and the patriarchal blessing. So the fact that there are such things as sibling rivalries in our modern world certainly can't be surprising to us if those things existed in our scriptures. And somehow, the death of a parent seems to, in lots of families, bring out some of the worst behavior that we can muster up. And we see these things in the media. We see right here in the United States, the Koch brothers, y'all remember the Koch brothers, the four of them who inherited dad's multi-billion dollar oil and refinery business and the battle that ensued for them to take control of that business went on for I believe a decade. It's a long time for brothers to be fighting over dad's business. In England, the Burgess family following allegations that the older sister might have unduly influenced mother to change her will, they spent the entirety of their inheritance on legal fees, fighting about who would get what. And so we have this interesting lesson from Luke's gospel today this very interesting lesson about a man who isn't getting what he thinks he should get from his father and has come to Jesus to ask Jesus to intercede. Now, what we know about the ancient world and inheritance is that the older son usually got a double portion for, of dad's estate. So if you were the younger son, you'd get a third of that, and older son would get two-thirds. 
Depending on what dad's estate looks like, that's a big difference. Dad could leave you living well or not living so well. And so we're gathering that who we're talking about here is the younger son who is unhappy with his share of the estate, and he's come to Jesus to say, please tell this brother of mine to give me some more. I don't have enough. I do not have enough. And Jesus refuses to intervene in this family squabble. And instead, Jesus has this incredible teaching moment that's much more than about inheritance. Because we don't really know what happened in this family. We don't know if younger son felt like he had been more dutiful and more faithful and more helpful to dad, and therefore he should get more because he'd just been the better son. We don't know if he was just greedy. But we know that he's asking for more. He doesn't have enough. And Jesus, teaching the way that Jesus loves to teach, tells a parable. It's a rich man, a rich man whose bounty is so tremendous. Booper crop this year, he has so much, his barns can't hold it. And so he's thinking to himself, what do I do now? I have all of this abundance. What do I do with it? I know I'll tear down my two small barns and I'll build some bigger barns. Because if I build some bigger barns and I can put all of this abundance in these big barns, I won't have to work for a while. I can just relax. This is so good. But there's just one small problem in this parable that Jesus tells, because who comes up in the parable to chat with this guy? God comes up in the parable and says, eh, 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 eh. You fool, this very night, your life will be demanded of you. And who's going to get all this stuff when you're gone? That's a big question. That's a big question for this man because he is so consumed with how do I hang on to everything I've got? How do I stockpile it? How do I hoard it? How do I keep what I've got? Because the last thing I want to do is let go of any of it. That's the last thing I want to do. Theologian and scholar Walter Brueggemann often these days lectures and preaches about this whole notion of living in fear of scarcity. From my mother's standpoint and my father's standpoint, I understand that because my parents, rest their souls now, lived through the Depression. And so the notion of scarcity was a very real one for them because there could just always be that day that you wake up and you need that one thing that you let go of the day before. So the notion of scarcity was a very real one for them. But when we allow ourselves to live in fear of scarcity rather than in thanksgiving for abundance, it causes us to live our lives in ways that are not life-giving. We are so concerned with how we hold on to things that we fail to realize how God would have us take care of all of God's people. And when our lives are demanded of us, when we have run the last course of this race, when our time is done, what's going to happen to all the stuff? We have been so carefully hanging on to it. 
I'm as guilty as anybody. I got family heirloom furniture. I'm hanging on to it. It will be pried away from my, my fingers on my dying breath because it's all that's left of my family and I'm hanging on. What is going to happen to all that we have amassed when our time here is done? Mitch Albom wrote a book called Have a Little Faith, and in that book we are introduced to a minister in the inner city who had a rather circuitous route to getting to the ministry, but now he's been called to a place where he has nothing. He's literally in a church that doesn't have a roof in the middle of the winter. Snow is coming in. But rather than living in a place of scarcity of mind, he lives in this place of abundance that I know God has got this. I know God is going to care for us. I know that that one more homeless person that we take in will be able to sleep them. And I know that that one more hungry person that comes in will be able to feed them. I know that because I trust in the great abundance of God. That is such a rich and life-giving place to live because it acknowledges that what we have while we're here, it really isn't ours in the first place. We have it because of God's graciousness. We have it because of God's goodness. We have it because we are stewards and we are entrusted to care for it while we're walking around here. And when we approach life from that standpoint, when we approach life from that place, suddenly this fear of not having enough is replaced with a sense of God will provide. As Jesus says in the verses that just follow this passage we have today, look at the ravens. They don't have a storehouse or a barn. They don't have any of that, but they eat every day. They eat every day because of God's great provision. And it is as true for us as it was true for those who were hearing Jesus' words 2,000 years ago. We have been entrusted with tremendous gifts. Tremendous gifts that make a difference in God's world, that make a difference with God's people. And when we live with the assurance of the real inheritance, because the real inheritance isn't about our stuff, the real inheritance is about the life that we will go on to live eternally with God. When we live our lives with a sense of that reality and that richness and that abundance. We see everything differently, don't we? We see that the ministry that we do at Operation Backpack that gives 360 kids school supplies to make them successful, we see that that's really not anything we'll miss. We see that when we feed a meal to someone who has no food, that that's really not anything we'll miss. We'll still eat. We'll still be fine. We will still know God's love and provision. And so I invite all of us this day to give up the notion that there is a scarcity of anything because in God there is no scarcity. I invite us to believe in God's abundance. I invite us to believe that God puts us here to care deeply for one another. And when we do that, when we turn our focus not on our material things, but on the life that we will live eternally with God. 
Who will we shape our priorities? Who will we think what really matters? We'll live as people who are abundantly blessed every day of our lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.